Welcome to Park Media. I'm your host today, Vince Emanuele, and we are joined by Liza Featherstone, who is a journalist based in New York City. She's a writer for Jacobin Magazine, also a contributing editor to The Nation, where she also writes the advice column, Asking for a Friend. Her work has appeared in The New York Times, Miss, and Rolling Stone, among many other outlets. She is the co-author of Students Against Sweatshops, The Making of a Movement, and author of Selling Women Short, The Landmark Battle for Workers' Rights at Walmart. Today, we are talking about her latest book, Divining Desire. Thanks for joining us again. It's a pleasure. All right, let's see if we can knock this thing out today. (laughs) (laughs) All right, we left off uh, sort of in the first half of the book, talking a little bit about women entering the field of focus groups, but we didn't really touch on this sort of fundamental shift that was taking place in the 70s. Admin and focus groups, marketing research are facing all of this criticism from the left, second wave feminists, um, but also conservatives. Um, and there's this sort of switch to like, we're no longer manipulating the people, but now we're listening to the people. So you can take it from there. Yeah, so, um, so advertising and market research um, generally is a just a real lightning rod for um, for criticism in the in the 60s it, it, beginning in the 50s and then really um, intensifying in the 60s and 70s as as there's just so much more um, um, general criticism of of our society under consumer capitalism um, and um, so there's criticism from feminists that um, that advertising objectifies women um, and is um, and engage and perpetuates gender stereotypes. That's um, that becomes um, a new line of criticism um, for the for the industry and a, and a very um, intense one. Um, there's also the um, you know the uh, I the sort of sense from the left in general, especially the new left, the sort of um, um, anti-capitalist and also kind of hippie left, um, like sees it as a source of, um, you know, a, a sort of, a, 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 a sort of source of propaganda um, alienating people by um, making them think that material, um, you know, materialism and, um, buying stuff is going to make us happy, um, and um, um, and then there's the and there's even some um, conservative criticism, you know, that it's you know leading to a kind of a um, like a, a frivolous lifestyle, like it's encouraging a frivolous lifestyle and um, an over sexualized consciousness um, among um, among people. Um, so um and and then there's also um, a like broader criticism of you know of capitalism in general that you know it's um it's exploitive um that you know this it's not sustainable environmentally and there's also you know criticism of of corporate behavior we see um um, you know Ralph Nader's book um, on car safety, unsafe at any speed, um, you know becomes a bestseller. You know, I mean these these sorts of um, examinations of um, of the role that corporations play and the indifference um, toward um, human life itself, um, you know, become uh, become really prominent in this period, um, and. Um, and market research becomes um, a um, um, like at times a lightning rod for that. It comes under criticism itself, as we've discussed, you know, beginning in the fifties. But it also becomes part of the solution to that problem from corporate America's perspective, because um, because what it has been, what it has done all along, is it has been a place for ordinary people to have a voice and be heard from. And so at, in this period where, um, where people have a lot to say to corporate America, market research um, is, becomes a, a, a tool uh, like in their you know, arsenal to, um, to address it and say, oh, look, we're, we're really listening. You know, we're really listening um, and, you know, and we hear you. Um, so, 
a, a, a really um, a fun example of that that I found was um, from this this um, ad campaign from the seventies um, that the Ford Motor Company did, and it just seems to be a, a very conscious response to so many of these strands at once. So you've got the feminists on the one hand saying, you know, you don't respect, um, you don't respect us, you don't respect women. And you've got the uh, Ralph Nader saying these people just don't care whether you live or die. And, uh, and, and this ad campaign was um, this, um, it's called, um, we asked them, um, and it, which is um, also just wonderfully encapsulates um, the the sort of plea of corporate America to um, to um, recognize that you know through focus groups and market research we really are listening. We promise. Right. So it's called we ask them, and um, and it it in it it has it features um, all these real life women. Um, to, who have, you know, and many of them have jobs, you know, they're a school teacher, they're, you know, they're not just, you know, some actress being paid to look nice and talk about cars. Um, there um, are all these different w- um, women talking about um, their ideas for um to for um for making the cars safer and ford motor company is showing how it implemented each of these ideas you know so these are they're clearly you know clearly these women had these ideas that came up in focus group um and um and uh, you know as much as pot and ford is creating a, a narrative about how these ideas were incorporated into car safety to make uh, make make cars safer, and it's just one of many examples of sort of um, discursively how the focus group um, could function um, as a way to um, make corporations um, seem like they were being much more um, responsive. Um, amusingly. Um, when um, when that um, campaign was focus group tested, of course the focus groups liked it a lot. <laughs> you know, I mean, they really people really liked yeah. that you know, the Ford Motor um, co- company seemed to be um, um, responding. Right, and you mentioned. I mean, one of the things that I find interesting, too, is you you mentioned throughout the book, not just these specific examples, but that this was taking place, the sort of bigger, broader structural political economy that you have this recession in the mid 1970s that also, you know, creates more and more distance, which is a theme throughout the book that this distance, I mean, today, it seems astronomical, but the distance between ordinary people and elites, um, I think I'm one of those people that I think as a young leftist was like, they're all the same. They've always been the same. Then I read uh, Chris Hedge's book, um, death of the death of the liberal class. I think it is. Mm-hmm. And, it's something like that. Yeah. yeah. And I remember, and I, I remember reading through that and going, Oh wow. No, they have changed that. In fact, yeah. that this is, you know, throughout time has become more and more distant, but that this is also taking place in the seventies that you have this recession. It creates more distance between the elites and ordinary people. Um, that's right. Yeah, and um, and and that's that's absolutely right. And the the focus group is always a, a lens of in in my in my story about it, but also the, I believe this is really true um, that um, it's always a, a lens to um, to look at the relationship um, between um, elites and ordinary people, and um, that relationship is always changing because um, elites change, and the rest of us do too. You know, we we go, you know, so. Um, I mean, our our mutual friend um, Christian Parenti has written about this period, the seventies, um, and um, and uh, and I, I believe I mentioned it in the book that I mean the um, you know because of um, the um, the recession and the changing um, economic conditions, um, but also the holdover from you know hippie counterculture, which was far more widespread. Than we sometimes understand it. Um, workers are really getting very rebellious on the job in this period. I mean, there are just like wildcat strikes, or just like people getting stoned all day at the plant. You know, and it's like 
really like the elites are kind of like, what are we going to do about this? Yeah. I mean, this was happening in the uh, military at the same time. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of great literature about just the breakdown of the military toward the end of Vietnam, where you had like X amount of GIs were doing heroin, X amount were like regularly taking psychedelics. Like this was like fragging their officers, like fragging the officers, walking off the, uh, you know, deserting, uh, you know, absolutely. So this is like, so, you know, they, um, it can sound like a conspiracy theory to talk about this stuff, but um, but you know the Trilateral Commission writes its report, um, you know um, that um, which literally contains the line, um, "What are we going to do about the public?" Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, which I think is just such a wonderful line. I mean, that they're they're really distressed by all the unrest that they see and um, kind of panicked about how they're going to manage it. Yeah. And this has implications even beyond. I mean, the next chapter you talk about, uh, I love the title, by the way, Entertaining Joe Sixpack is wonderful. <laughs> when that title came up or when that name came up, when did that come up? I You might have mentioned it in the chapter, but was it like, was this Sarah Palin era? Was this like Obama or was it before? Uh, yeah, that? I, I think so. Okay. Um, um, I, that's, um, I, I forget when that phrase emerged, but it's so, um, yeah, it's, it's just so amazingly condescending. Yeah. It is. And, and yeah. I, and I call yeah. some of my friends that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I, the point that you make, I mean, you bring up, you use this story of sort of fatal attraction to talk about how much this is, how they've, how it wasn't in fact focus groups that have fucked up the entertainment industry or if you want to blame like bad movies in Hollywood like the blame is because there's extreme pressure to produce blockbuster films that the right. focus groups are not to blame for this and then when something goes wrong Hollywood elites are like ah it was the people like the focus groups fucked up it wasn't us and the the you know need to make 500 million dollars off of a movie i found it funny that you brought up fatal attraction because i sort of used that f- film as a an, an example of like just how warped Hollywood can turn I mean different books stories the changes that they make but not only that I mean I was thinking a lot about feminism as I'm reading your book um, and it seems to me that like the most that the real story is like sleeping with the enemy like that that's actually mm-hmm. like that's reality like that's yeah, what the fuck totally. would really happen and that yeah. like anything like fatal attraction is like no like no i don't know any i any stories like this like i know no, i know a hundred no, exactly. stories like sleeping with the enemy but um absolutely in any absolutely. case you can yeah, i'll no, let that, you talk about right. the i'll let you talk about the sort of impact that that this has had uh in hollywood or the way that they've sort of used this to cover for their own terrible mistakes yeah <laughs> and you're so right sleeping with the enemy is like like um films like that which which actually there were a lot i mean sleeping with the enemy is a little is later um um but um but in the the 70s um actually there were a lot of um movies that very realistically depicted um like life in america and um, and things get um much more um detached and fantastical like in the eighties and nineties and, um, and, and, um, and downright, um, in, in, and sort of into sort of this downright, um, bourgeois male paranoia, um, which we see in fatal attraction, which yeah. is like, I mean, I'm not a film scholar, but that stuff is nuts, you know? Yeah. Um, and, um, basic instinct. Ba- I was just thinking An- another eighties. <laughs> yeah. The, um, the, the, yeah, the, the um the lady ha- is um um has a an ice pick uh, Sharon I mean, it's, Stone it's, a childhood crush right, but yeah <laughs> right she was I was way too that. young to be watching that by the way like I was because right. I'm 36 now so I don't know when that came out but you I was like I was like 10 or 11 like watching yeah. that and I was like oh my god like i just remember thinking like mom and dad are not going to be pleased if they find out that I no, uh, no no but anyway i don't mean to keep i don't mean to keep no no uh, no not to, not, to, not to derail but um but but it was a very it was a very strange period for movies and so yeah so so it's it's not unusual for focus groups to play um a huge uh, to to play some role in in in, um, in shaping movies and and that one 
um, in particular, the um, the um, the actress um, Glenn Close had a very um, um, l much later had a lot of um, complaints about the process. She had done a lot of research on the psychology um, of the character um, and um, and on um, what sort of um, what sort of mental disorder she might have had and what would be an authentic um, and just sort of um, realistic um, action for her to take in that situation, and um, and the the where the movie went was just nowhere related to that, um, you know, and just you know wasn't a, even a convincing, um, it wasn't even so it wasn't even a, a convincing trajectory for um, you know a um, a crazy person right. you know, who was crazy in the particular way, um, and. So, you know, so, you know, people often, you know, Hollywood people get so um, mad about these kinds of things, the, the focus group ending um, and, um, and there, so there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a, a lot of, they they fan a lot of cultural flames uh, of flames of cultural discontent around around this around the role that market research plays in movies, um, but I, I think that um, you know the um, I mean the the more that you look into the factor shaping Hollywood, it's just um, it's just so much about um, money and profits and the incentives to just make bigger blockbusters and. Um, and the focus groups are just a small part of that process of the dumbing down of you know making movies that suck you know i mean and it's, it's really like capitalism is pretty um terrible for um for culture i mean and um and and the and the focus groups it, it's fascinating how um, much hostility um, they um, they engender because um, I, I think it becomes a way um, for um, for um, us to blame each other or us to blame like other um, Americans like those dumb people you know have you know um, just you know their sensibility up their ass and they thought this was a good way for the movie to end um, and you know. And you know, instead of um, blaming all, sort of all the profit forces that converge um, to make the movie um, stupid, and I looked a little bit at um, gaming culture, which I'm a total outsider to because I don't play video games, but I like I, I looked um, at um, a lot of um, gaming boards on which they were discussing the focus groups and the impact on the uh, on the games, um, and it seemed like a really similar dynamic to the one that moviegoers have, where they were just like, like all these dumb people, um, you know, um, and um, and their input um, made this game so bad. You know, had we been in those focus groups, right, right. You know, we would have been able to um, shape a different outcome. But again, you know, it just, it's, it kind of just becomes a way for, um, um, to, um, blame each other instead of the, the the people who are really in charge. Somewhat similar to uh, politics. I mean, you know, we, we watch the um, the people on TV, you know, after a presidential debate and, you know, they, and they always have the undecided people who are sort of, um, you know, at some Your point. stories were so real. Like I, when you told the story about, cause I'm going to, we'll go out of order. It makes more sense actually to get into I want to talk about the entrepreneur striking back. The way that you've t formulated this, I want to talk about the entrepreneur striking back, and then the appalling, uh, the the sort of I forget what the title of that is, but it's like yeah, we're like appalled with ourselves. The the um because then we could just sort of go back into politics, yeah. but yeah, I mean when I read some of that in the book, I'm going Jesus. I I mean we've sat there before and watched this sure. and been like who the fuck are these people like where the <laughs> fuck did they get these people from i mean you're just the whole time you're like oh god oh yeah so anyway i there's so many moments in the book that i was just like oh i've done this before <laughs> just absolutely. Like, yeah, it absolutely. is it's like i feel like part of the book was to make like leftists feel guilty about our 
our uh, elitism sometimes. Oh, no, I'm there, too. I mean, that's, I mean, the who are these appalling people comes out of like that. I mean, that was, you know, my um, um, my my friend, my sister, actually, but I make her into a oh, friend. Oh, okay, okay. Protect the guilty. Um, and the, uh, <laughs> the uh, you know, and my, and my sister is like, who are these appalling people? Yeah. <laughs> and I was, I was like, yeah. What? And then, then later I was like, it's all about that. Well, like that, the, the, like that's, that, that's our stance toward each, our, our, our each other, our, our, our fellow citizens, because we just can't help, we can't help blaming them. Yeah. No, it's, it, it resonates on a deep level politically. We were, I mean, we were talking about it like, when you're political, when you're doing political organizing work, actually, I use a different example. When our friend Francisco stopped by on the roof to talk to us the other day, he was like, he was like, why is everybody so, you know, it's this everybody thing where it's like everybody's so dumb or everybody supports Trump or this. It's like this, you start to like just overly simplify everything. And it's like, well, like trying to remind ourselves that only 23 point whatever the fuck percent of like voting age people voted for this guy. Like fifty mm-hmm. percent of people over eighteen, they just don't even bother. And oh, yeah. then when they're polled, like they're not like huge Trump fans. Yeah, it's a and it's an even smaller number now. Yeah, um, I mean we, we we're not exactly surrounded um, by fascists. No, no, <laughs> like, it's so I mean, different. I mean, we talk yeah. up. This has been coming up so much over the last four months, and even now with the election, you you know you'll hear people. And I understand where they're coming from. And I think that the, like Trump saying like he's going to stay in office no matter what or do whatever. Like, I think Mm -hmm. you could read that a million different ways. Um, I'm not as concerned because like even the Trump supporters we know, like there's no one, I'm kind of bumbling through this, but the, what I'm trying to say is that the right isn't really organized either. Like there isn't like, even here in Northwest Indiana, like we can't like go find, like people will tell us all the time, like, Hey, have you tried to organize Trump supporters? And we're like, how the fuck are you going to find them? Like, do you just want to go door by door? Because there's not like a local, like brown shirt group or like a local, like we're the Trump militia and here's where we hang out and we meet every Monday. Like they don't even organize. They're like at home trolling people. Like, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like drinking and being like, fuck these libtards. Like, Right, it's right, like right. what's going on like it's not like an organized group of like highly disciplined people with a coherent political ideology anyway yeah. i know we're yeah. going way off track but so yeah. the way that this is uh, so i'm just telling you that as someone living in what is called trump country like the, right. like there's hardly anybody in northwest indiana that, that will like openly even support this guy anymore right um, that's fascinating too but the impact it's had, so we're blaming each other. This, the, the chapter I wanted to jump to, because I think it jives with the point you make also about movies and, and video games in the book, is that a lot of times when fans have official input, people really like the fan outcomes of sitcoms. Yeah, or like, that's like right. The fan outcomes are like, yeah, like the fans have a good pulse on like what should happen here. It reminds right. me of the chapter, The Entrepreneur Strikes Back, because what's his name? Malcolm Gladwell. He sounds like a real fucking prick. I don't even know who he is, but anyway, I like reading him in the book. I'm like, who's this fucking guy? God, like he's somebody who definitely deserves to get slapped. Anyway, the, uh, I'm glad you, hear you say that a, a friend of mine who I gave the book to in, in a draft form was like, you talk way too much about Mars. I'm like, you Malcolm must not Gladwell like him. Huh? You hate him. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I mean, I guess it's unseemly, but... <laughs> I don't know who he is, and you made me hate him, so you did an excellent job yeah. on that. But the the uh, what, what I think the parallel is here is with Apple, though. So I was thinking in the chapter about Hollywood and so on, that this the, the portion about Apple, that there was like this, the rejection that, like, Gladwell represented this in, this portion of the elites that was like, we're now going to like look down on ordinary people. Like they don't know. So it shifts again to like, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. And in fact, we're going to like tout the fact that we don't pay attention to them, that like the entrepreneur is the one who's a genius. But in reality, you show that with Apple, that wasn't the case that in fact it was the workers themselves, which is even more interesting than the consumers. But anyway, go ahead. Right. 
Yeah. So, um, so there, there, so there comes to be this, um, this backlash, um, you know, um, stemming a little bit from the, um, I mean, it, it, it's, it always finds a, an eager um, audience in the public for the reasons that I've just described. We're like, we're always willing to blame each other for um, the problems of, of capitalism. And, um, um, and, but then it's, um, it's, you know the um so in the in the 90s um and um early 2000s the um the, um elites really take this um anti focus group rhetoric on and um, and really um re really start um scapegoating it um very hard um and um and the um you know the there's there's a number of there, there's a number of flashpoints um, I identify um, among them. Um, you know the uh, the um, George W. Bush uh, George uh, yeah George W. Bush the second one. I was like which Bush was it? <laughs> yeah. But um, so in the um, you know in the it, it, you know the second the second Bush um, in the um, you know two uh, thousand three. Um, you know, beginning of the war, and there are all these you know popular protests um, against um, um, the interventions um, in Afghanistan and Iraq, and um, and uh, and he dismisses the protests, saying um, saying I don't govern by focus group, right. you know, which is so so striking because he, he takes something that um, that kind of everybody thinks is debased, the focus group. Um, and uses that to uh, to to characterize any popular and in intervention, you right. know, any um, any kind of input from the people is a focus group, which is um, so which is so interesting, and um, and uh, you know, of course, that that was um, that was comical and ridiculous too, because. Um, of course, not true. I mean, the Bush administration did make extensive use of focus groups, even if they didn't want to listen to protesters. Right. You know, um, and um, um, and and there's a lot of um, and conservative politicians, particularly, um, who um, mostly were listening to focus groups quite a bit, um, but would make a lot of rhetorical hay out of how they weren't, um, and. Um, and um, and there was a certain um, um, kind of um, masculinity and um, and you know associated with that. Like we don't need to listen to anyone. We're just going to make the decisions. Bush says at one point, "I'm the decider." Right. Um, right. And um, you know. <laughs> It's the memories, a, it, the fucking it, memories. It, I know it, it's <laughs> awful to flash back on these things. It's uh, uh. the um, um, and um, and so the um, um, you know entrepreneurs like um, like Steve Jobs um, also make a a lot of get a lot of media attention for talking about how they don't use focus groups and they don't. You know, the, and um, and St Steve Jobs um, talks about th this a lot. You know, he's, he 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 um, uses this um, this fake quote from Henry Ford that is really popular in the business media. Um, you know, if I asked, you know, that if I had asked the public what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Um, that um, you know, he's supposed to have said that about the car. That you know, it, it actually turns out um, that quote is probably. Um, invented anyway right. but um, um but but it's it, it it's it it becomes this sort of way of um you know they denigrate the focus groups in order to um exalt um the um the the power of um individual um businessmen you know um or or individual politicians usually republicans um and and they um um and the um and and it's so um it's it's so fascinating because you know it's it's such a um it's it's such a bizarrely illiberal worldview that becomes um so widely quoted throughout the business press you know that like that um you know whereas the business press in the 50s is all about you know the you know like market research is great and it shows 
how much we are listening to people and the consumer is king. And uh, and in this period, in the in the of uh, early in the early aughts, the conventional wisdom is the exact opposite. That no, the consumer is trash. The public knows nothing. You know, listen to the smart men. Um, and um, and so um, and so it, you know, it's quite a, a leap. Um, and um, and the um and and quite a a shift in elite strategy i would say um you know that um that rather than the strategy being to um to make it seem like we're all on board and we're all part of this project of um of making capitalism work um, the, the, um, the 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 project really shifts to shut up <laughs> you know, we just we don't want to hear from you, um, which, is, which is a very uh, different um, elite stance. Um, and um, so I, I thought that that um, that that was very interesting. But as you suggest, um, it's it, it's not only interesting as a shifting style of domination. Um, it's also interesting be, um, because um, it is not true. Um, I mean, in this case of of, of Steve Jobs, um, it may have been true that they weren't um, consulting the consumer as aggressively, um, but the Apple products were not invented by Steve Jobs's own unique um, brilliance. Um, it was a um, a management style that flourished. Um, and allowed um, many um, of the engineers who worked for Apple to come up with their own ideas, um, often based on what would they personally like to listen to, like people, you know, and, and they felt like, oh, it would be really cool to be able to listen to music on our phones, right. you know? I mean, and they just like, they were, and, and so if anything, it was, um, it was a um, more um, organic way of, 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 of like a, a sort of more um, more radical way of thinking about um, how things could be invented. That it could be through um, a relatively horizontal workplace, um, you know, where um, where the where the workers are um, are respected, and um, you know, actually, I think he was a horrible boss and Steve Jobs is really kind of a dick. Um, but um but um and there was a lot of pressure and stress on these people, but their ideas were definitely respected and they were encouraged um to uh, to be creative um, about them, which is certainly, you know, if we think about what kind of society we would want to see, we would certainly um want society to function in much more that way. And it is um far more actually far more democratic um, in many ways than uh, than you know asking the impersonal consumer what they might like right no absolutely and the big shift at the same time the if from you mentioned from the 50s to the early 2000s and sort of the corporate world and that shift in in the way that uh researchers and marketers and so forth were were looking at the public but then the shift in politics is to in it's like fuck bridging the gap. We're mm -hmm. just going to start selling people policies that they absolutely hate. So now yeah. how do we sell people a bunch of shit that they really don't like? Yeah. It's like, oh, great. You know, yeah. This makes so sense. This, <laughs> so, so this is an amazing shift um, that uh, um, where um, um, you see in the, um, you see in the 90s, especially as um, with Gingrich and the contract, um, contract i know that we used to joke and call it contract on america and so sometimes i think that that's, <laughs> that's really good. what it was but but it, yeah. it was actually contract, i think it was contract with america <laughs> um, and you know and the sort of um sort of ascendance of um of of a very um very serious right-wing policy um in in this period um and um and and also with um, the ascendance of of ver of a much further right wing Democratic Party in in Bill Clinton, um, and um, and so both of but both of these um, political tendencies are using focus groups quite um, a lot. Um, but what's um, what it, what is um, um, interesting is that 
um, they really um, shift toward um, they they really they are really shifting toward policy that nobody especially wants, and so they have you know so policies that are really in in no one's interests other than a few elites. So you see um, um, the uh, Republicans pushing um, much lighter taxation for the very rich. Um, and um, and so um, so you know out of their focus groups um, grow these um, these terms like death tax for the estate right. tax. Now, the estate I mean the estate taxes um, is it's really in almost everyone's interest to tax inherited wealth very heavily. Yeah, like, right. like most people don't have hardly any to speak of. Right. You know so 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 to tax that and put it um, into um, public goods that benefit everyone is is very um, um, would be a very popular um, policy is a very popular policy whenever people understand it clearly. Um, so so terms like the death tax, which makes it sound really mean, you know, oh my God, someone's already dead and now you're gonna tax them. It's like insult to injury, like sounds awful, right? You know, so um, so, um, so 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 you see the the focus group um, used um, more and more to um for um um to test um unpopular policies and figure out how they can make them um how they can make them more popular and similarly i i i i i argue similarly that um you know a lot of the products of the 50s like early household products um are um you know I mean, maybe people didn't really need them, and there was a, a creation of of kind of um, false needs. Um, but um, but you know, a lot of you know basic household appliances um, did make um, you know women's work around the house um, somewhat easier. You know, and you know do and have you know, somewhat improved all of our quality of life, you know, if we're lucky enough to, you know, not be homeless and have some of these things, you know, um, so, um, so, and, and whereas, uh, I mean, like the vast majority of products that are being advertised to us now, oh, you know, geez. we have all these basic things are entirely unnecessary. <laughs> yeah. You know, so like, so, so, so you could really, you can really kind of see, I mean, a parallel in a way between, um, you, you know, that 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 the um, the purpose um, the purpose of as the purpose of elites has changed, the purpose of market research has changed. You know, to, um, you know, and it's and it's it it has um, really pivoted to um, selling us on um, policies that um, we really don't want and products that we probably don't need. Let's go straight to today then. And I'll make, let me say this. So for people who are watching or listening, if you want to get the story about Coca-Cola, the new Coca-Cola, which you'll find funny, Liza, I brought it up to my mom the other day on the phone and she's like, oh, I remember that. She's like, yeah, it wasn't that bad. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, that, uh, apparently that's what most, most people thought. But she also mentioned, she was like, oh no, people did. There were people who lost their shit. And I was like, really? Oh, yeah. So you remember that too? So anyway, yeah. I thought you'd find that interesting. Cause I was like, I love it. I, I asked her I and she's it. like, yeah, it wasn't that, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> um, and I'll leave the chapter about, so if you're watching or listening to this, you need to get the damn book, buy it. Mm -hmm. I know that everybody's broke as shit right now, but it's like two packs of cigarettes or like a trip to Wendy's. And that's well worth and it. If so I can be vulgar, it looks really pretty. It is. It's like one of the it coolest. Like really Hell yeah! Who designed this? What, what? Who designed the uh, front, Liza? Oh, a um, a, a wonderful um, a wonderful designer um, named Andy Dark. Okay, cool. Um, who does a lot of our covers, uh, or, or the or books covers? Um, They're some of the best ones. Speaking of good marketing, I'm a sucker for or books. So you call it or books, I call it or books. Okay, so or books. I think that's actually correct. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I get or I get some shit from or books just because I look on their catalog and I'm like, look at that cover. Like, yeah. Um. So I'll leave the professional respondent chapter and the chapter on uh, the new Coca Cola that came out uh, 
for people who can read the book or please read the book and check it out. And so we'll leave kind of a couple of surprises in there. But I did want to touch on before we uh, go, we talked a little bit about who are these appalling people. <laughs> um, and, and the point that you're making with this, it, it, one of them at least, I don't want to speak for you, but one of them is that simply listening or simply having a voice is not enough. That we need real political power. Why? I mean, I really appreciate the way that you end this because when Occupy took place, this was, um, shit, what, 2012. So, you know, this was like towards my late 20s. I had been home from the Marine Corps from, you know, at 22, I got home, joined the anti-war movement, was like in that first four or five years of getting involved. You might find this hilarious. And in hindsight, I find it embarrassing. But, you know, I dropped out of college uh, when Occupy was going on because I'm like, oh, it's happening. I'm like, it's happening. Oh, like yeah. the shit's going no. down. Like I don't have time to go yeah. to class and all this shit. And I just remember my professors being like, please finish. Like I was in my last year. Yeah. I still haven't finished, but I was in my last year of school and I was like, ah, fuck it. I'm like, the revolution's coming. Like I can't be yeah. sitting here worrying about grades. Um, totally but understandable. God, the, the, the criticism though, in hindsight, I think is so right on. I mean, not even it's 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 loving and solidarity criticism. It's like we yeah. want these movements I mean, I, to succeed. Yeah. Like, yeah. so how do we make them more powerful? How do we make them more effective? Like, simply having a voice isn't enough. Like, we do need like a big political program that brings massive amounts of people who don't self-identify as leftists into the mix. There's a whole bunch of things I'm sure that we probably agree on, but I'm interested, really interested. So you'll have to read the book those of you listening or watching to get that portion about Occupy. But what I am interested in is this sort of conclusion, like where the hell are we today? We've got Trump and Biden. It's like 2016, but worse because people don't like anybody again. And they even like Trump worse. I mean, I don't know. Um, but the, an interesting point you make that jives with the interview that we just did with Michael Hart about um, him and Tony Negri's latest book assembly. And he's, there's like a big portion in there about, uh, data mining and like the mm -hmm. social reproduction of capitalism you yeah. mentioned this as like we're all in the day-to-day -day focus group now like we're yeah. all in focus groups we're yeah. all members of focus groups and like it's day in and day out so I guess two-part question one is what does that look like today with data mining and us being on our phones all day in social media and then the other side of that, and we can wait, is just kind of where are we at today? Like, what does a focus group mean when we're getting even worse politicians than what we want? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, I'll let you go. Yeah, so um, the, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, we are, um, I mean, even though sort of, sort of the, the focus group itself is, um, is, you know, it isn't going anywhere and is going to be around, um, I think, for as long as um, for as long as we have an unequal society and elites who are out of touch um, with with the rest of the people. Um, but um, but, you know, the 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 focus group itself in this in its strict definition, um, you know, isn't isn't maybe quite as important as it used to be. However, we are, um, as you suggest, um, we're all in it all the time now because every time we go on social media and we give our opinion about things or we say where we're shopping at the moment, you know, I mean, you know, we um, or or we uh, post a selfie, we are giving um, we are giving um, marketers and um, and corporations more information about ourselves and about our opinions um, and we're giving them to um, political consultants who mine all that stuff as well, um, so um, so so we are just we are just constantly in a focus group, and so I mean that and and you know it's it's sort of curious to observe um, on one level um, you know at least with a traditional focus group you're getting paid for your opinions and you know what you're you know you you know what information you're offering up and uh, and you may be uh, more in control of that um what's um but what's um maybe even more fascinating to me is that um on a similar level we um we take pleasure in it and can get stuck in it and can mistake it um for um for some kind of meaningful input 
or some sort of meaningful influence um, or engagement um, when, um, w when in fact um, we are just um, giving voice, we are just um, engaging in um, what Russell Jacoby um, called endless talk. Um, like and um, and you know it is very um, easy to get caught up in that, um, and it's very easy for um, for for um, for social movements to get caught up in that. I mean, Occupy was um, was you know sort of at the um, you know you know somewhat early days in terms of social media having as much of a hegemony over our daily lives as it does now yeah. but um but it but it certainly um it certainly was um was influenced by that culture of consultation that every everybody has to talk all the time and that there is a political act in being heard itself um, um and you know and that was very um it was very, it was very prominent in in all the symbolism around Occupy, like the people's mic, you know. I mean, and um, and there, um, um, and so so yeah. I think I I think I think we we need to be we need to be very um, mindful of the ways in which um, we can end up um, we can end up back in the focus group. Um, of all the time, even when we think we're engaging in something more radical. Do you see that I've, it seems to me that there's still a struggle within movements that we still have like some of that left over, but that I think one of the great things that I've seen or experienced was first in 2016 with Bernie. I think this brought things back around to like no, we need programs and like we need to change the material conditions of people's lives, like simply giving them a voice on the weekend with a bullhorn isn't yeah. going to change their rent or yeah. their ability to send their kids to childcare or their education. Like, so yeah. that I thought has been nice. And it, and it seems um, there was a group of us that went down to Ferguson in 2015, a group of activists from Gary, Indiana and other cities throughout Northwest Indiana. And when we got down there, it was like, a, a more intense version to some degree of Occupy where people were out on fluorescent Ave in, in Ferguson and it, the immediate uh, demand of course was more clear because it was like, we want something to happen with the police, like the police specifically, yeah. this is an issue. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there was a lot of like, I was watching like Occupy methods in a different context and I was yeah. like, oh, wow, like, look at this. Like, it's more intense and more visceral because these people are like poor and working class black folks from fluorescent Ferguson, Missouri, which is different than a lot of the people I met in the Occupy movement. Um, actually, uh, your partner, Doug, brings this up in his book. One, it's probably my favorite portion of my turn. Um, and that is when the Black Lives Matter activists made their way backstage to talk with uh, Hillary Clinton. And it was mm -hmm. like they were saying all of these things, but they were never saying, like, these are our demands. Like, this is exactly yeah. what the fuck we want. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think we're moving in that direction. Do you see that? Like, do you see us sort of edging more in that direction, but that we're not quite there yet? I do. I think there's been a real shift. Like, I and I actually think that, the yeah, the, the, the kinds of, um, the, yeah, the, the kind of, the kind of political exhaustion that we saw, um, you know, um, in um, in Occupy, I think, is really shifting over into something um, else. I mean, although you know, as you you know, as as you see, you can still see it, um, but um, but it's um, but um, I think this um, this most this most recent uprising um, around the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor killings. Um, I think has been um, has has been far um, far different, um, f um, far more um, um, far far more focused on delivering results for the people. Um, I mean, and we see like that already. Like some school systems and particular schools have been, um, you know, being have been 
um, getting um, police officers out of the schools. There have been, uh, you know, there, there have been some serious demands to defund the police coming before city governments. Um, you know, that the, there's, the, there's a, like, the, there's a very, um, you know, there's, there's a very uh, serious focus on, um, on power and demands which were, you know, which, which were um, so fuzzy in this kind of giving voice way in the Occupy moment and are so, and is, is so much more, um, I think, in focus right now. Um, and I think also, um, you know, I think you, you're right to mention the Bernie movement, you know, I think while, um, w while that's in some ways, like, you know, different people and, you know, with a different, um, with maybe a, a like a somewhat different theory of how change happens, um, the 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 focus on specific demands and specific uh, political changes we would like to see, I think, is really similar. I think Bernie really um, Bernie and the um, the um, organizing around him, I think, really helped to um, to bring that into our, our political life. I mean, and now, I mean. Um, you know, I mean, I'm a little bit partisan. I'm a member of the Democratic Socialists of America, and like, and in in New York, we just um, we we just got five socialists into state government. Yeah. You know, and by you know by talk and mostly by talking about housing issues and aff affordable um, housing and you know, people are, you know, getting evicted because it's a pandemic and a recession. And, um, and, you know, we've, you know, we've been trying to stop that, you know, and you know, trying to like, to, trying to like talk um, seriously about, um, about how to um, make things much, um, um, much more um, workable for working class people, um, and so it's it, you know it, it's it's very. Uh, I th I think we are in a really different kind of political moment right now, you know, and and, and I think you know some I, I think it's it's easy for you know for some kinds of some sometimes for serious people to be like oh you know abolition of police like what are you talking about and you know and it's like. Um, but um, but I, I think that that um, behind the rhetoric, you can also see a lot of very concrete demands that people are organizing around. I it was heartbreaking both times around being on the left in places like Northwest Indiana, Southwest Michigan, Southeastern Ohio. I think one of the frustrating things is that we see a lot of these debates taking place in like on the coast, usually, you know, that like mm -hmm. a lot of the left, the, the institutional sort of established left exists yeah. on the coast. Yeah. Um, yeah. The media entities. It's the a problem. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge problem. Yeah. <laughs> and so like we would see these debates, wild debates about Bernie, like both from the liberal press, from like, say the MSNBCs of the world, but also from like, left press and like the debates that would happen around like the Bernie campaign. And like, we were also very aware of the limitations of the campaign of policies. We would have liked to have seen better, like U S foreign policy, different things. Like there were yeah. things, of course, like we were sophisticated enough to notice those things, but just this like hammering him on crazy stuff. Like he didn't say this at the debate it was so, it was so sad for those of us living in a place like Northwest Indiana, where you feel you already feel in a place like Indiana, where you have very little electoral influence at all. Like it yeah. just doesn't matter. You're not a swing state. You yeah. don't have outside of Indianapolis, a major metropolitan area that's in like nobody cares. So it's like, you're always watching these things. You're organizing and doing what you can, knowing that it's really going to be on people in this state, this state or here, here to like mm -hmm. make it happen. And yeah. it was just yeah. heartbreaking because both times around, it's totally anecdotal, but like we knew both times that like this time, I don't know, now with the pandemic, who knows, but last time we were pretty fucking convinced that like if Bernie would have been the nominee and he won Indiana, right? We're, and whereas Clinton beat Obama in Indiana in the, in the 0708 primary, and mm -hmm. we were just like, 
it was just heartbreaking. So then the second time around, it was just like, oh God, like it was like that the conversation had changed at a certain level in like the professional class of people who are having this talk about Bernie, but that all these working class people I knew were still like, we fucking love Bernie. And like, he's got to win. Like, this is our guy. Like, this is our last chance. And then like flipping something else on. And it would be like this really petty thing about like, yeah, but Bernie looked like he kind of spoke over this woman or something. And I was just like, Oh no. I was like, they're like how much that misses the kind of people we live around in this Rust Belt area. I I won't go on any further, but I'll kind of like let you finish with, I don't want to broaden it out too much. So let's kind of focus just with like the political electoral sort of social movements uh, position that we're in today, because yes, we've got the pandemic and climate. I mean, if we add all of this, we'll both be drinking by the end of this. So (laughs) let's just focus for, and to finish up, like, what do you make of that? Cause you, I know you guys live in, in New York. Um, what do you make of that kind of like division on the left? And I don't want to overstate it. Like, cause we have friends on the coast and now with the media and the mm-hmm. ability to communicate, it's not like you really live in a different world, but in a lot of ways you do live in a different yeah. world. Yeah. And so it's like, what do you make of that? How are you sort of processing just the political moment that we're in right now? Yeah. Um, well, I think, um, I mean, you know, the, I mean, it's in so many ways, um, I mean, Trump's ascendance um, did mark, like Bernie's ascendance, Trump's ascendance kind of did mark a um, a break with the kind of political culture I describe in my book. Like it did, it did mark kind of a break with that sort of, consultant class like packaged very multiply tested um you know tell people exactly what the, what we think they want to hear um type of politics and i think um i think on the right um that really um trump um, really resonated partly for that reason and on the left bernie absolutely resonated for that reason um you know bernie um didn't um, didn't use focus groups in his campaign. A lot of politicians say they don't, um, but the um, but the um, but I, I did speak to people um, very inside the Bernie campaign, and they were like, they were like, no, like like he really disliked that very strongly, and um, and you know he just he wanted to talk about the same thing socialists have been talking about for like a hundred more than a hundred years, right? <laughs> like how to make life better for working class people, <laughs> like it, like that you can't test that. I mean, it, I mean it's arguably been tested and often worked out really well, and often been defeated by um the capitalist class right i mean that's the tension it's not so much about are you going to find the exact right sound bite you know um and um and then on trump's end um you know that the sort of sense that he was delivering um something that was a break from what the consultants want you to hear um did did resonate kind of similarly with a completely different um, group of people um and so you know um even though um you know trump's um trump's message and sort of, and persona is extremely um consumer driven you know like he will test like certain lines at his rallies right. and see like how much do people cheer for that so like people so lock her up about hillary clinton people really liked that and he you openly know? talks about it yeah he's like they I like can't... it like they like it you see they like it it's like so it's yeah like... and my ratings my ratings are good. like he, he talks about himself all the time as yeah. if he is consumer product right. like my ratings are great uh, you know and, <laughs> or, or right now why are my ratings so much worse than anthony fauci's like but it's like it's it's just like he is like you know why it's like is a fucking fauci? walking yelp review he is like why is anthony fauci a better consumer product than me right now like he's oh, just shit. like basically like that's a, like a lot of his conversation um and um and so uh, i mean i think 
um, you know, we're, I, I mean, I, I think that, you know, we're going to see um, yet again. So, 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 so part of Trump's appeal was that he was a break from that, but in the end, he just is that, you know, he just is, he just is a, a yet another, um, um, you know, politician who is a consumer product. Um, and, um, and I think because of material, the material situation that we're in with the recession and the pandemic, um, the, um, the sort of complete bill of goods that this particular consumer product is, is laid bare, I think. And I, I think, um, I think people are um, really pretty uh, tired of him. Um, I mean, and, um, and, you know, I, I am sometimes told by, um, by friends who live in more in Trump popular areas that, um, that, you know, I'm being overly optimistic, um, but I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it does, I mean, it, it does seem like there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of polling data in a lot of places and people are doing so terribly. Um, and um, none of it, it, it looks particularly good for this incumbent. I think that, um, um, I mean, you know, even if, even if focus groups and marketing have reduced all politics to being kind of um, an act and a performance in the way that I describe in my book, um, I think, um, I think Trump's, um, it's particularly blatant in his case and, in, and that his particular act um, may have run its course. Do you think that there could be a pushback insofar as the response could be like one of the things I've been thinking about is do you think that the like the industry can only reinvent itself so many times and then like it seems like with most things it then just starts to bring back like retro like what's the like what did we used to say to the people in the 70s like let's go back to manip we're listening not manipulate like yeah. I f like I wonder if after Trump that there could be like this pushback and now the people aren't going to demand this but how the elites could try and like morph like it seemed to me that the perfect focus group candidate was Pete Buttigieg, who comes yeah, from totally. our neck of the woods and who is absolutely fucking hated by all kinds of people throughout the state, but who's also yeah. loved by like a certain sect of like liberals who watch like the West Wing. I don't know where these fucking people come from. Like they watch yeah. the West Wing, whatever they're doing all the time, but it's like so weird. They would be like, he's a, they would say it almost like Trump, but from the liberal way, they'd be like, he's a veteran and he's gay and he's a road scholar and he, like they would just go down the yeah. list i'm like oh yeah. so like he has all the check but anyway i yeah. just hope here's my my last question for you it, are the pete Buttigieg is dead forever in, in national politics or do you think that like there's going to be a resurgence of like let's get some of these like really well crafted i've been like struggling with that since all of this has happened like could we ever go back to an obama or like today, like the Obama and Buttigieg's of the world, it just seems like they could get on TV and like 80% of people would just be like, yeah, whatever. Like, I just don't buy any of this shit anymore. That's the sense I get. I just wonder if that's the same sense you get. You're right to zero in on Pete Buttigieg. He really, um, he really was like the perfect um, sequel to Hillary in, in being that, that really, um, that, that, that totally, um, um, focused group candidate. I mean, I mean, he even had worked for McKinsey. Like he was like, he, he was, he was the culture of consultation. Like, you know, and I mean, and, and you're right with like ticking all the boxes that would like make certain liberal elites really happy with all of his credentials. I, I think that um some of the most like hate mail I've gotten um, was was I wrote a column kind of making fun of him oh. and people were so upset because oh, <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, like he he was very unpopular votes wise but there was a, a lot of um, passion for him among certain um, uh, on certain liberal centrist sectors so I mean sure they might try again um, I mean I noticed that um, um, the Biden campaign um, doesn't have that feel right now. Right. I mean, like it, it's pretty, um, I mean, and it might be, there might be something about the, the 
specific moment that we're in that really strips things down to basics, uh, you know, where, you know, he's just in his basement, like kind of rightly calling out what Trump is doing right. Right. and not doing. And it's pretty, um, there's, it feels very um, interesting, like an interestingly low artifice moment for the national Democrats in a way that we haven't seen in a while. Uh, so, um, I mean, I guess in, in some ways this, um, um, this moment may, um, you know, just be from because of the extent of the suffering um, in the country from sickness and um, economic hardship. Um, that he, you know, obviously, I think Bernie would have been better, but um, but a relatively um, difficult to market candidate. Um, it may indeed be the best <laughs> bet for beating Trump right now. Yeah, no, just keep him in the. I just hope they keep him in the basement. <laughs> totally. Get whatever they got to give him to keep him, you know, is you know, seemingly somewhat vibrant. I don't. Care. I mean, whatever. I I just want him to stay in the basement so we can just win, have a different conversation about how we're going to combat neoliberalism. We've been through exactly. this with Obama. We've got movements. Totally. I think who've been like we talked about. Movements are more sophisticated now. Biden yep. wouldn't get the same kind of honeymoon that Obama would get. I mean, the day o o Biden takes office, I would, I mean, I know people who are like ready to go. Like they're like, no, we yeah. got to keep this guy, hold him accountable. Way different than what oh. I remember in 2008. Or I think yeah. maybe what we would have gotten with Clinton, where you kind of would have had this, she's the first female president, like, That's and great. she would have endured a bunch of crazy sexism. So then you would have had to play that game, like with Obama, where you're like exactly. defending, but then criticize. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you so much, Liza. Your book, the book is Divining Desire. I had a lot of fun reading it. Sergio read it as well. He loved it. So, oh, great. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate your time. Yeah. And we'll talk to that. you. Well, let's talk after the election. Yeah. We'll absolutely. do an episode where I we just it. drink wine. That sounds good, too. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, Liza. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Take care. You too. You've been watching Park Media. I'm your host today, Vince Emanuele, and we'll talk to you soon. Hey, thank you for watching and listening. If you think this program is worth a pack of cigarettes or a cheeseburger, you could become a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. The link is available at our website, parkmedia.org. That's P-A-R-C media.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Also, you could find us on Instagram at Park Media, Facebook at Politics Art roots culture and you could find me on twitter at vince emanuele